So I'm going to present to you all this stuff I have in 25 minutes. So in order that I don't lose uh, almost any one of you, I will start from very basics. The claim is that uh, Dirac formalism of 1928 later made into a quantum field and with the 1937 remark of Bhairana, identifying B dagger with A dagger, that is not the complete story of spin half. We have been under the impression that that is the complete story, but that is not true. There, even, there is even a no-go theorem which says it is a complete story, but also is not true. It turns out that for spin half, there exists another formalism, another field, which does not satisfy Dirac equation. And it is a bona fide spin half field. It transforms as a spin half field. It is a fermionic field. Its propagator is that of Klein Gordon multiplied by an identity matrix in half zero plus zero half representation space. So its mass dimensionality is one. It doesn't support the local gauge symmetries of the standard model, so it turns out to be naturally dark. So how can all these things happen? Okay. So you st we start out with 1928. So 1928, we have Dirac. 1937, we have Mahirana. 1962, Ankara lectures uh, by Eugene Wigner. There he suggests that for every spin, there are four possibilities. And these are called Wigner classes. So there are four different type of possibilities. A little later, 1966, Lee and Wick point out that there are four Wigner classes there is only one quantum field which is local. One quantum field which is local, and that local field is the Dirac field for spin half. Nineteen sixty four. in a paper called Feynman Rules for Any Spin by Steven Weinberg. He has a theorem that uh, the Dirac field for spin half is the unique field which can exist. Nineteen no, I think we'll go forward. 2005. Daniel Grumilla, who is now in Vienna, and myself, publish a paper which uh, in Brazil has become sort of a Bible. So it is this 76 page paper. It starts out like this. We provide the first details on the unexpected theoretical discovery of a spin one half matter field with mass dimension one. And then we continue. So how was that possible? And that is what I'm going to talk about. 
how that became possible. So how the canonical wisdom, the no-go theorems uh, have been bypassed. So re remember that uh, Dirac field, or for that matter, any field has a general structure in configuration space. So you have the momentum integral, then you have the expansion coefficients, which for the Dirac fields are the U spinners and the V spinners. And then you have the exponential of I minus P mu X mu, or e to the power I P mu X mu. And then you have the creation and annihilation operators. So the basic elements are two U's and two V's, and then you have the annihilation operators and the creation operators. These objects, first spin half, live in the half zero plus zero half representation. And you can show that these are the eigenspinners of the parity operator, which is this. So U and the V spinners are just the eigenspinners of the parity operator. And if you're not familiar with uh, this form of the parity operator, then let me just give you a brief introduction. You have the uh, right type while spinners. And you have the left while spinners, which transform under the Lorentz boost. And this is dotted into phi, which is the rapidity parameter. And cosh phi is E over M. And cinch phi is P over M. And you can see that under parity, in the half cross half, there's in the Minkowski space, phi goes to this goes to that, that goes to that. So the right and the left while spinners go into each other. And that's why you have the four component while spinner, sorry, four component spinner. which is so if you want to impose parity then it should be such an object that this it will take this into that that into that and in addition it will take p2 p prime so under parity psi of p will go to 0, 1, 1, 0. So that will do the job of flipping these. And then you will have under parity, that's what happened. And here you will have a psi of parity transformed p mu. If you replace this parity transformed psi p mu in terms of psi p mu, you will get the boost operator and a few things like that. And you work it out. And then it becomes a very nice operator, and that was published by uh, Brazilian mathematicians a year or so ago, <coughs> probably two years ago, uh, by Speranza. So this is the parity operator. So the equation is nothing but the eigenspinners of the parity operator. So once you have the U and the V spinners, which are simply obtained as the eigenspinners of the parity operator, Then you make the quantum field out of it. Take its adjoint, calculate the expectation value of the time order product of psi and its adjoint. The important thing to remember is that uh, the information about the propagation from x to x prime is contained not only in the field, 
but also in the adjoint of the field. That's the important thing here. And this is your Dirac propagator. If you act the Dirac operator in the configuration space from the left hand side, you will get the Dirac delta function in four dimensions. Delta x minus x prime. So to write down the adjoint, you have to define psi bar, which is psi dagger gamma zero. So who ordered this particular structure? And the reason was that the psi dagger psi uh, is not a uh, Lorentz invariant, so this uh, gamma naught had to be put there. The question is, is it unique? And the answer is that this definition of psi bar is not unique. So to proceed further, just as I constructed the parity operator here, I can construct the charge conjugation operator without referring to any Lagrangian density or a wave equation. And then I ask, instead of making a quantum field whose expansion coefficients are the eigenspinners of the parity operator u and v, I make a field, we'll call it lambda of x, which is expanded not in terms of eigenspinners of the parity operator, but the eigenspinners of the charge conjugation operator. I do that. So instead of this, and a new adjoint, which I'll talk about in a moment, but just to fast forward a bit. Suppose I do that. So this is a field in which there are two self-conjugate eigenspinners of the charge conjugation and two anti-self-conjugate eigenspinners of the charge conjugation. I construct this thing judicially and evaluate this object. Magically, this object is the Klein-Gordon propagator. That was the four page in PRD in 2005, and the 76 pages in JCAP. The magic and evading the theorems was in constructing a new adjoint. Because it turns out, if you calculate the eigenspinners of the charge conjugation operator, they have a generic form. Let phi be a left transforming wild spinner, which transforms like that. Then I can show as a theorem that a phase times Wigner time reversal operator theta phi star, this transforms as a right while spinner. So I have a right while spinner, I have a left while spinner, and I can fix up this phase by demanding that charge conjugation operator acting on lambda of p gives me plus or minus lambda of p and this demand fixes this phase to be plus minus i. So that is the explicit form of the eigenspinners of the charge conjugation operator. And those I put into an expansion for this field. And then I evaluate this. And this is a Klein-Gordon uh, propagator. So what it took to reach from there to here and uh, claiming a breakthrough. What is a breakthrough which is involved into it? The breakthrough is a better understanding of this adjoint, of this adjoint. And the breakthrough happened next door and in a parking lot. And uh, there was a series of lectures with Paddy had asked me to give here, or maybe Paddy's students had asked me to give, I don't remember. But I remember Paddy being involved into it. And it was a wonderful experience. So my only request to the students was that usually I give two or three hour lectures. 
So I need a chai samosa break in the middle, which Krishna Mohan took responsibility of, and I had a lot of chai samosas. And uh, I give her this series of lectures, and then I ran over my three months, so I overstayed a week, and we finished the lectures. And the parking lot I was leaving, and Krishna asked uh, this question, which I had been asked, have I found the answer? I said, no, I know what the answer is. So then I went to a monastery, I worked it out, and it was beautiful. So the thing is that if you can uh, calculate, so if you construct these explicitly, it's quite simple to do, and calculate lambda bar, lambda, under the Dirac dual, you find that for massive particles, it identically vanishes. Okay. So then you have to see, okay, people then said, okay, we will forget about this thing, we'll uh, promote them to the Grassmann numbers and we'll move forward, and that's how people have moved forward. And then uh, supersymmetry came about, and there was a, this beautiful thing of going from fermions to bosons, boson to fermions, and what is happening there? What is happening there is, apart from transmuting the statistics from bosonic to fermionic, in that process you're also transmuting the mass dimensionality from three half to one, one to three half. That is happening. A trace of that is here, I'm talking about mass dimension one fermions, so some sort of a symmetry exists, which take mass dimension three half fermions of Dirac and Maharana, into mass dimension one fermions, for which we have no name. Okay, so this is zero. So then we go about and say, okay, how do we construct? So I have a lambda, which is a four component spinner, and uh, so you could think of it at any object in any representation space. You could consider it like a vector x also, if you wish. Now I have to construct a uh, dual out of it. So what I'll do is I have to lay it flat because I want a number out of it. So I lay it flat, and then I can put some four by four matrix which will shuffle these things any which way it likes. And the other freedom I want is I don't have to, so I have four of these, uh, lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, lambda four. I don't have to take lambda one to lambda one, I could take lambda one to lambda two, lambda two to lambda one. That is allowed in mathematics. There are some things which have to be satisfied, but as long as you satisfy those conditions, invertibility, et cetera, you will be in game. So therefore, there could be, one could put, uh, define the dual in the following fashion. So this is a matrix which does this job, lambda one to lambda two, lambda two to lambda one, or lambda one to lambda one, et cetera. It will do that. For the Dirac case, it is just an identity matrix. Take its dagger and put this matrix 4 by 4 there, and this is the most general form of a dual you could construct out of it. You demand that lambda bar lambda is the Lorentz invariant under boosts, under rotations, and you find that the eta has to satisfy the requirement that eta must anti-commute with the three, each of the three generators of the boost, and it must commute with each of the three generators of rotation. So that is the requirement which comes about on this eta here. For Dirac case, this cascade matrix is just identity. For these new objects, it is something else which uh, I have written up, but uh, that will take too much time to, how much time I have? Five minutes. Okay. Now you solve for eta because you put in the input what these generators are. You solve for the eta, and you find that the eta has the generic form zero a a zero zero a's are real b zero zero b zero 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 zero, and if you demand parity covariance in addition then this reduces to gamma zero. If you, are, you had a x mu here, this eta will come out to be the Minkowski matrix, modulo of phase, which is very important. 
okay. If this cascade matrix is identity, this is a Dirac case. For uh, these eigenspinners of the charge conjugation operator, this is a matrix whose job is to take lambda 1 to lambda 2, lambda 2 to lambda 1, and that's all. Under that dual, you find that, so there's a new dual. Under that, this is not equal to 0. In fact, it is 2m for the self-conjugate uh, pieces, self-conjugate the plus sign, and minus 2m for the, this. So this is where I was before the lecture started in Ayuka about uh, one year and four months ago. The problem which in the intervening 10 years we discovered that this theory violated Lorentz symmetry. It was covariant and only under a subgroup of the Lorentz introduced by Cohen and Glashow in 2006. So we're sufficiently satisfied with it, but, but uh, Krishna Mohan and his uh, uh, Swagath and uh, where is Karthik? Karthik is here somewhere? Ah, Karthik is sitting there. Karthik, they were not satisfied with it. He said, there must be a freedom. And they were absolutely correct. And I discovered that freedom in the parking lot I was leaving it. The freedom is that not only you demand that lambda bar lambda be a Lorentz invariant, but also the spin sums in which you have the structure lambda, lambda bar. That is a 4 by 4 matrix. That that also be covariant or if invariant, fantastic. And it turned out that there was indeed a freedom which I had not exploited. So there is not only that you should constrain this and this in such a way that lambda bar lambda is an invariant, but the spin sums are invariant also. And there was that freedom which I discovered. And uh, that I wrote into another 40 page uh, paper. I think it will appear in the advances in applied Clifford algebra by invitation. So once that was discovered, suddenly something magical happened. The 2005 theory, as we discovered later, in 2005 we already discovered that it was non-local. In uh, intervening years, we discovered it in addition to Wallace's Florent symmetry. So quite a few people were quite a bit allergic to it. The moment this freedom of in the adjoint was exploited, we found the theory became Lorentz covariant and the theory became local and then it became at par with that of Dirac. By local, you mean the Schwinger anti-commutators are satisfied. So that is the magic which has happened uh, thanks to Pade. Uh, the ERC had invited me here along with Jayant and Naresh. Uh, the first invitation was from Naresh. Uh, two decades ago, something like that. And, uh, but the last uh, coming here for three months was a, a truly magical. First thing is I realized it, that Paddy has formed a group like of which I had not found anywhere. These students are absolutely brilliant and their questions were very innocent, very sharp. And uh, they, you know, I have certain limit of distinction in the community, this and that and this and that. But these guys were saying, we are all physicists, we are going to ask good questions, and they asked good questions, and they made me feel very welcome. And uh, this problem then got, so I, they asked this question, I answered this, that question, and the, now the result is that we now have a mass dimension one <coughs> fermionic quantum field of spin half. Time is finished? OK, so I'll take two minutes to finish it. And it is local. It is Lorentz covariant. So all the problems which are known have disappeared. In addition, it is a very natural candidate for dark matter. You can show in a formal manner that it doesn't support the local asymmetries of the standard model. So the darkness comes to itself. Uh, there are about uh, 100 or so papers which are entirely spawned by uh, this work. But the latest of this paper is in cosmology, where this Brazilian group uh, starts out with the uh, einstein carton Alco system, uh, solves it exactly numerically uh, under a certain appropriate conditions for each uh, uh, epoch of the evolution of the universe. And they find that the Alco field 
in their model, pervading all uh, the universe, gives you inflation after about 90 foldings, uh, it transits, and then you have the dark matter, which is again ELCO, and at a later stage, it gives you, a, uh, depending on the parameters, what is the self-interaction of this field. By the way, this field self-interacts, despite being fermionic, because if the dark field uh, psi to the four is a dimension six operator, therefore it is uh, suppressed by two powers of uh, unification scale. For this field, uh, lambda to the four is the dimension four operator, so quartic self-interaction is allowed. So you tune the coupling constant here, and with that, uh, along with the uh, uh, constant piece they have in the potential, uh, you can change how the transition of the late time acceleration, the expansion of the universe comes about. So it seems it is not just mathematical science fiction, but uh, it gives us that it might be very important for cosmology. Not only that in particle physics, the extension of the ideas which come in evading all these no-go theorems is you'll get, uh, uh, you got a much better understanding of the Higgs, uh, cosmic magnetic fields. They come about the extension of this work to one zero plus zero one representation space. When you go to spin two, then uh, you learn that uh, that phase I talk, talked about when you solve for this eta, and then you get the Minkowski matrix plus a phase. That phase becomes important in understanding the Higgs, and it becomes important in obtaining uh, unitary and renormalized dual theory for a field which contains spin 2, 1, and 0. With that, I will say thank you very much. Paddy, uh, you have formed such a wonderful group here. And uh, the magic really exists, which my wife, uh, Gayatri, sitting there reminded me. So this is a very interesting place. So tell me why. So you have banyan trees, and apples fall from the banyan trees. <laughs> <laughs> There is an apple by the Newton, which you see. And uh, so I had not noticed that, but she had noticed it. So thank you very much, Paddy. All the best wishes and congratulations to you. And you have done such a wonderful job. I don't have enough words to say it. But your students are there, and they tell me that what you have done with them is just absolutely remarkable. So thank you very much for doing it for the community and for physics. Thank you. Time for a question or two. This Zedingian group that you referred to, is that this paper published? Which one? This is the archive. This, this is the archive. Oh, yes, yes. All the things are published. I have not no, given. Resilient that uh, Elko field, huh, yeah. dark energy is just. This is the, the archive. It has just come on the archive. So the, the my own work has published with the, let me give the names here Dimitri Shit, uh, Cheng Yang Li, and uh, Sebastian Horvath. Uh, uh, New Zealander, uh, German, and, uh, and, and Austrian. And uh, so they're, they're all in physics letters B, J HAP, and uh, so they're all published. These, these Brazilian papers, uh, which come, it is on the archive, yes. And they have written beautifully. It's like three weeks or something. Yeah, it's about three weeks ago. Three, so. huh, three weeks, huh? Uh, Shanki is here. Shankarnay. Ah, oh, Shanki is there. Uh, one of the first papers on the, on the cosmological implication of this field uh, was because of Shanki. This is there. Uh, Christian Boimer uh, has contributed to it. But only now the excitement has begun for me because we have now a mass dimension one fermionic field of spin half, which is Lorentz covariant and which is local at par with that of the Dirac. And uh, it is, uh, we just opened the Pandora's box. And I'm very excited about it. I'm looking forward uh, to developing collaborations and uh, things of that sort. But uh, I don't, may not have too much time because I'm 64 already. So two or three decades maybe maximum. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to ask whether there are the observational prospects for you know observing the effects of this. Yes. Uh, yes. In uh, in cosmology, like you said. Yes. 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 And very are people good. doing it in particular. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Yes. On on both fronts. On both at CERN fronts. as well as in uh, in cosmology, okay. the effort is there. Right. But uh, you being so young and smart, join it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. yes, those efforts are there. Are there any other questions? There are no more questions. I'm sorry? Sorry. Yeah.
could you be a little bit more specific about the way this dark matter candidate is different from other dark matter candidates and what kind of experimental differences you need to observe it? Yeah. So the first thing which is, for example, coming from, uh, from this Brazilian group is that, uh, and, and there's also an Italian group, uh, Luca Febri. So uh, Saulo Pereira. So th the thing is that uh, Dirac fermions and uh, these new fermions, how did they interact with torsion? It is very different. So if you look at the Dirac fermions, uh, these U and the V spinners, you'll find that uh, the helicity of the right transforming and the left transforming components are both same. So if I introduce in a gravitational environment, both of them will pick up a phase, and that will be a global phase, and it has no physical consequences. The, for these new objects, the structure is the helicities are opposite. Because of that, whatever phase this picks up, this phase is opposite. So it becomes physical. So in the presence of torsion, the Dirac fermions and these new fermions interact very differently and their cosmological consequences. The potential which comes up in this uh, model actually arises from uh, such phases. Okay? And uh, in terms of the physical observability, the quartic self-interaction, which is not allowed for the Dirac fermions, or it is suppressed by two powers of the unification scale, is allowed here. So you get a quartic self-interacting fermion. Uh, uh, fermionic dark matter, which uh, uh, you cannot get a fermionic self-interacting dark matter in the uh, canonical framework. So that's another uh, difference which is there. All type of interactions are uh, forbidden because, it can, it, because of its mass dimensionality, it can, cannot enter the uh, standard model doublets. And, uh, and the darkness comes about because the gauge structure is very, very different. So there's a huge number of uh, observable consequences of it which we have to now see what are the precise signatures. There are papers from IIT Kanpur, uh, from Pankaj Jain's group, uh, which have written up. But now that the, it, we are free from the violation of Lorentz symmetry and lo locality problem, that uh, the game is really beginning now. And this is the first talk anywhere I have given on the subject. Thank you, Professor Alvani.